Um, I'm going to be coming from a very familiar passage today. I'm in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm going to bounce around a little bit, um, starting off with verse 1 through 3, and then heading down to uh, verse 20 through 6. Amen. Amen. When you have it, say God is good. Amen. Amen. And it reads, after this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Mayunites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Adam, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazazon, Tamar, that is En Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. Skip with me down to verse 20. When you have it, say the devil is defeated. Amen. He ain't got no feet because he's defeated. Amen. I couldn't wait to say that. Hey, Leah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting to the people, pay attention to this verse. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat anointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. As they went out at the head of the army, tap the neighbor closest to you and say, praise went first. They didn't get excited enough. Tap the neighbor next to you and say, praise went first. That's a good place to praise him, saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord sent ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. Tap your neighbor, say they were defeated. Oh, my God, my God. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. When the men of God came to the place that overlooks the desert, the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off in their plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing, and also articles of value more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. On the fourth day, they assembled to the Valley of Baraka, where they praised the Lord. This is why it is called the Valley of Baraka to this day. On your way down to your seat, I want you to keep on um, the forefront of your mind another verse that goes with the text that is in Hebrew 13, verse 15. Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. You may be seated in the presence of, Lo of the Lord. If I had to put a title on today's sermon, it would be, Will You Praise Me in This? Hallelujah. I, I'm one of those feedback ministers. I need y'all to talk back to me today, oh God, uh, today, okay? So I know that I'm doing all right, because if not, I'm a faint. Amen? I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm just playing. Well, what is praise? Hallelujah. We all know that we're in a message compilation talking about the fundamentals. Um, we've talked about worship today. We're talking about praise, um, and later on in the month, we'll talk about prayer and unity. Um, but I was excited when I um, was given the assignment to talk about praise because if you know me, you know praise is one of my favorite things, amen. <laughs> uh, from a child, they always called me Shouting John because in the midst of everything, I was going to lift my hands. In the midst of everything, I was going to give God what's due. But I know you're saying, okay, well, minister, we're talking about the fundamentals of praise. 
What is praise? Well, I'm glad you asked. The praise, according to Webster's Dictionary, um, praise is the expression of approval or admiration for someone or something. Praise, according to the Bible and the definitions of the words in the Bible, praise is an act of worship or acknowledgement that acknowledges the virtues or deeds of another person or entity. If I had to simplify it, praise is simply acknowledging God and his power. We praise God every day in so many little ways that we probably don't even think about it. And I know we live in a culture today where you can get onto TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all social media outlets and see videos of praise breaks and people picking them up, putting them down. And um, I know you may think, well, if I can't do that, I'm not praising God. Well, that is false today. I came to debunk that thought because if you are simply acknowledging God and your heart has the intentions of acknowledging God in his power, then you are in fact praising God. Can I have somebody praise God in this place today? When you woke up this morning and you said, God, I thank you for waking me, that was praise. When you were driving down the road and you were singing shackles by Mary Mary, you were praising God. When you walked into the church today and you said, God is good to the greeters, you were praising God. It is a privilege and an honor. Don't get churchy. Don't get your, don't do that, because I'll holler. Don't do that. Hallelujah. You have the ability to praise God today. You know, y'all, Leah, you know I'm churchy. He, he hit them keys. Oh, come on, man of God. <laughs> don't do it yet. We, we going to holler, okay, but not just yet. I need to preserve my voice. Well, when we take the time to praise God, we are acknowledging that he is worthy of our attention and admiration Praising God is not just acknowledging God, though. It is acknowledging his authority and willingness to come to our rescue. Praise is a way that we draw closer to God. Now, I know you're saying, well, is God not omnipresent? Yes, he is. He is always with us. But the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. How many know what inhabits means? Inhabits means to live in or to dwell in. When we praise God, I'm really just surrounding myself and my situation with the presence of God. Amen? So if I have the ability to surround myself in the situation that is bothering me, the situation that is causing me chaos, if I have the opportunity to make that submit to the presence of God, why not praise? Tap your neighbor and say, why not praise? Hallelujah. And see, King Jehoshaphat, while reading this test, I learned was a man that understood the importance of acknowledging God and his power. See, because in the face of literal war, now I, I didn't um, read all of the text, but I want to give you a little bit of context on what was going on. See, King Jehoshaphat was a king in the land of Judah, and he got notice that it was not one, not two, but three armies coming up against his one army. Um, some people in their natural mind may say, well, that was a guaranteed defeated war. If you have three armies coming up against my one army, something got to shake, amen? And I don't know about you, but I'd panic. I'd be on the phone with my cousins, like call a friend, tell your friend, we finna go to war because they pulling up, amen? But in the face of a literal war, King Jehoshaphat chose to turn to and acknowledge God and his power. And it says, rather than ruminating over the issue, he immediately went and inquired with, sought out, and spoke to God. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3, it says, Alarmed Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he then proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. Other translations say, Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set himself determinedly as a vital need to seek the Lord. Vital means of great importance. Jehoshaphat understood that seeking God was better than seeking a solution. And I want to take it a step further to say that he understood that seeking God was his solution. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, before moving forward, I want to point out the humility that it must have took for Jehoshaphat to praise God in that moment. Tap your neighbor and say, praising God sometimes takes humility. To tell his army to go into prayer rather than to prepare for a fight with an army that is three times their size. I'm sure there were many people throughout the kingdom and the army who thought that King Jehoshaphat had lost his mind. I'm sure that there were many people within the army that said that King Jehoshaphat wasn't hitting on nothing and he probably should step down. They said in the middle of this war you want us to seek God and praise God. And yes it is true that he was a man of power, 
But he showed his people that my power is nothing compared to the power of praising God. It took humility for King Jehoshaphat to stand there in front of his people and say, praise God in this. When I'm sure that many other people were looking at King Jehoshaphat like, dude, you the king. What are we supposed to do? You want us to go and pray in a closet? They finna come kill us. What are we doing? And I'm sure that they thought that he was weak and considered him weak. But my question to you today is, can you praise God when it makes you look weak? I want to testify about a few months ago, around February of this year. For those of you who don't know, I do foster care for autistic adults. And um, I had an individual who, um, she took it upon herself to go beyond attacking my character. She attacked my character, she attacked my staff, she attacked the home, my home and the care that we provide in that home. And it looked for about three weeks, almost every day, I got a call from the CEO of the company um, with different things that she was saying. You know, well, DeAndre does this, DeAndre does that, he doesn't do this for the boys, he doesn't do that for the boys. And every time, you know, I would get frustrated because it seemed as if every opportunity that I had to defend myself, I didn't get an opportunity to. And I began to get frustrated because I'm like, God, when am I going to tell my truth? When am I going to be able to tell my truth? When am I going to be able to debunk these lies? When am I going to be able to show that this is not the case? And God says, you have to be still and understand that I'm working for you. And so I had my staff, who was my brother at the time, and a couple of my colleagues looking at me like, well, what are you going to do? Um, you, you Dion, you got connections in Raleigh. You got connections within the state. You're going to call. What you going to do about this? You're going to make a report. You're going to... Um, counteract her report. I was like, I, I ain't going to do nothing. And in that moment, I had to submit to the fact that I know that I may have looked weak to a lot of them. But God revealed to me in that moment that I can never be labeled weak because I'm strong in my submission to God. And King Jehoshaphat showed that, that I may be a man of power, but my power is second to God's power. My power is nothing compared to the power of God. King Jehoshaphat set his power aside to submit to the power of God. So going back to the conversation that um, King Jehoshaphat had with God while he had his troops praying when they should have been in many people's opinion, preparing for war. King Jehoshaphat went and had a conversation with God where he basically reminded God of his promises and doings in the past. And he stood in a place of expectation for God to do what he had already promised and declared. Now, I know we had read a couple of scriptures, so you can go with me to this passage or not. Um, but I want to read it to provide clarity um, on what happened between God and Jehoshaphat during this time. Um, ch verse 7 of the text that we came from, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7, it reads, Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it, to forever, give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built it in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. He says, all the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon a descendant of Zechariah, and he said that, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. So this was God's response. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jerusalem. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your posi positions, stand firm, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. 
he basically was like, all right, God, you've said in your word before that I'm yours and your protect was yours. This is a land that you have protected in the past. This is a land that you have appointed and anointed, oh God. And here comes these war, these, these um, armies coming up again to attack against the land that you have anointed and appointed. So God, what are you going to do about it? And I come to let you know this morning that King Jehoshaphat stood in a perfect place because he stood in expectation and he got out of the way of God. Now, I know that's something that's foreign to us because we oftentimes like to look for natural solutions in situations that we're going through. We oftentimes try to find solutions that make sense to us. We oftentimes try to find solutions that make us not have to wait on God. But King Jehoshaphat said, rather than using my own power, rather than using using my own uh, resources rather than using my own allies, I choose to stand on the word of God and stand in a place of expectation. And I come to let you know this morning that you too have the ability to stand in a place of expectation. You too have the ability to stand on the promises of God. See, God said in Isaiah 55 and 11 that in the same way that my words leave my mouth, they don't come back to me void without results. My words make things happen that I want to happen. They succeed in doing what I sent them to do. So I come to let you know this morning, cousin, that God promise that he said in his word to touch not my anointing and do my prophet no harm. You can bet your bottom dollar that he's going to stand by it. He said in his word that he will supply every one of your need according to his riches and glory. You can stand on that. He said in his word that he will give you perfect peace. You can stand on that. He said in his word that protection, peace, and glory is yours. You can stand on that even in the midst of what you're going through even in the midst of what you're going through. My God, today, and in verse 9 of the text, Jehoshaphat didn't just acknowledge the promise that God made. He acknowledged the promise that he made to God. He said, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are fixed on you. He was in a place where his declaration was, okay, God, I don't know what's going on. I'm a little afraid. I'm a little scared. I ain't going to lie. They're pulling up, and I don't know what to do, but I trust you, and he stood on that. He stood on his declaration that, God, I'm trusting you so you can find me here, oh, God, praising you. You can find me in the midst of this with praise on my lips. You can find me in the midst of this and my people in the midst of this worshiping you. Going back to the text, it said that as they went out and marched to the war, that King Jehoshaphat traded his strongest armies with his praisers. King Jehoshaphat knew nothing but to praise God. Praise was his solution. He took away all of the other. He took away the cushion. He took away plan B's and plan C's. He said, praise is my only option. This has to work. I challenge you not just today, but this season get, to get to a place where praise is your only solution. Because when you get to a pr place where praise is your only solution, you have total faith that this thing has to work. That's all. That's it. My praise is the only thing that I can rely on. And I know you're saying, well, cousin, well, minister, well, brother, praising God is hard. No, it's not. Maybe praising God is only hard because you're focusing on finding a solution rather than allowing praise to be your solution. The Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. Like I said before, praise means to live in, to dwell in. He's in your praise. If you're looking for a solution, it's in your praise. If you're looking for a rescue, it's in your praise. If you're looking for deliverance, it's in your praise. Set aside everything else and praise God this morning. I learned that praise becomes easy when you get to a place that you really trust that God is going to deliver and do the thing that he said he could do. See, praise and trust goes hand in hand. I praise God because I trust God, and I trust God because of the evidence of goodness that he's given me time and time again. And I know that you're saying, well, okay, minister, that's your testimony, but God may not have did anything for me. Well, let's reevaluate what, re what you consider good. The fact that you woke up this morning with your sound mind is a reason to praise God. The fact that you woke up this morning with breath in your body is a reason to praise God. The fact that you are here today in an atmosphere where God is moving in, I declare God is moving here today, that is a sign of his goodness. Don't you dare tell me that you don't have a reason to praise God. Praise is not hard. 
praise is worth it. Hallelujah. Reading this text, I found out that praise is also a sacrifice. King Jehoshaphat blessed me because he showed us this. The Bible says in Psalms 54 and 6, 54, 6 through 7, with a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks and praise your name, O Lord, for it is good, for he has rescued me from every trouble, and my eye has looked upon satisfaction on my enemies. You better, you better witness, babe. You better witness. If anybody is going to say nothing, you're going to say something. Come on. I love it. I love it today. King Jehoshaphat had many options on how he could have responded to the situation. As I said before, he was a king. And I'm sure he could have called in favors to other countries. He could have pulled in his allies. He could have recruited more soldiers to his army. There were options that King Jehoshaphat could have naturally done to prepare for this war with three armies coming up against him. But what King Jehoshaphat did is he sacrificed not only his emotions but his power to take control of the situation he sacrificed to the point to where he was in a place naturally and spiritually where he was totally dependent on God to rescue him he sacrificed it all and chose praise it says in the text that when Jehoshaphat and his army was marching out again he exchanged the strongest soldiers with the loudest praisers and put them at the forefront he led with praise, and the word says that as they were on the way to the, arm, to the war praising God, that God sent confusion within the army, and by the time they got there, it wasn't an army for them to fight. I come to let you know this morning that you praise God because your praise precedes you. I praise God the way that I do because I know that my praise is going to get to that situation before I do. That praise is going to give me results rather than the results that I can get on my own. My praise is is working for me. Praise is a sacrifice that I'm willing to take because I understand that my praise is what's going to win the battle. Don't allow the enemy to convince you in this season that your praise holds no value because when you praise you have heaven's army standing ten toes down behind you ready to do whatever, however it needs to get done to guarantee you the victory. Amen. Today and I know we think about sacrifices and we cringe because most times when people ask us to sacrifice something, it's only beneficial to the person that's asking us to sacrifice. And we don't like to do it. But I challenge you today to sacrifice your emotions sacrifice the power that you have. I know you macho man, I know you got it. I know that it's easy for you to find solutions in the middle of financial crisis. I know it's easy for you to find natural solutions in the middle of depression. I know it's easy for you to find natural solutions when your marriage is going haywire and your children is acting crazy and your job is acting crazy. It's easy to find these quick fixes and solutions, but I come to let you know that praise can do more than what these solutions can provide you, amen? Amen. I'm closing. I told y'all I won't be here long today. Um, while I was driving down the road the other day, I was in a place, a very dark place. Um, we're getting ready to go into a very dark place. I was at the place where I was like, God, I'm tired. I'm frustrated. I'm overwhelmed. And I don't care what happens. Every time my phone ring, I just let it ring. And I looked at it. I said, what will be, will be. On my job, I said, I don't care. I got two weeks behind worth on work. In my house, I was just surviving. Parenting, I was just surviving. Being a caregiver, I was just surviving. I said, God, I am tired and I'm frustrated. And if I'm being honest, I don't think it's fair that a servant like me has to go through this. I don't know if anybody else in this place is going to be real, but I was a little cocky with it. I said, God, you know, I, I'm not perfect, but I do, I do right. I, I treat people right, God. Why do I have to go through this, God? When is my relief? Why does it always feel like I have to be at the bottom of the barrel before you come and rescue me, God? And he said, I know you're not about to get up there on Sunday and preach about praise and think you don't have to. I said, well, okay, God. <laughs> I know you don't think you're going to have to get up there and talk to these people about praise and challenge them to praise themselves out of their situations and praise themselves out of the fire and praise themselves out of whatever they're going through and think that you don't have to praise. God said your praise is a place of even exchange. I need you to exchange all that you're feeling right now 
all those solutions you coming up with your mind. I know. I know it's easy for you to just give up everything and walk away, but I need you to sacrifice that desire. I need you to sacrifice your emotions. And how many know it's hard to sacrifice your emotions when, if we're being honest today, being in your emotions is comfortable because there's no accountability there. I can sit in my emotions and mope all day and ain't got to worry about nobody holding me accountable for it. I can sit in my emotions all day and be angry about situations. I can sit and, and ruminate over the situation and just be there. But God says, you are at a place of even exchange. If you trade all of that for praise, you'll come out of this thing. And I'm like, well, can't you just come get me and I'll praise when you get here? Please, God, please. And God said, the fact of the matter is, I'm going to rescue you anyway. I'm going to advocate for you anyway. You won't be in this long. I'm going to be your help that I said I would be. I'm going to be your provider that I said I'll be. But if you praise me in this, it's like I said before, you're inviting me in. You're inviting me in. You're inviting me in to come in with power. You're inviting my presence in. And if it's one thing that I've learned over the past few years is that his presence makes the difference. If you ask me, why I praise God the way that I do it's because every time I turn around it's God making a way for me every time I turn around and I'm in a situation where it looks as if it has a hold on me God is showing his hand and he's showing his power if you ask me while I'm praising we hooping now if you ask me while I'm praising I can tell you that it's because when I was 11 years old my God today I didn't grow up in the most peaceful household but I learned at a young age that when I raise my hand and praise God shows up if you ask me why I praise God the way that I do I can tell you that it's because when I was in college suffering depression looking at a bottle of pills ready to end it all God said if you praise me things will change if you ask me why I praise God the way that I do it's because I'm standing here today with not one but two incurable diseases with medications not working let me add that if you ask me why I'm praising God, it's because God's hand has always moved. God's hands always move. And I told you that while preparing for this sermon, you know, God always got to give me a little lesson to, to, to make sure I know what I'm talking about. Two days ago, uh, I heard a loud thud upstairs in my house. And I ran upstairs to one of my foster son's room because he always doing something in there. And I was expecting to go in there thinking that, my God, today, thinking that he was tearing up something. But I went in, and he was on the ground shaking. And for a minute, I thought that he was choking because he has a diagnosis where he eats everything, and he was making a, 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 a gurgitating sound. But then as I looked closer, it was foam coming from his mouth, and his hands was turning blue, and his mouth was turning blue. And I yelled to my wife. I said, baby, call an ambulance. And I picked him up, and I laid my hands on him, and I said, God, we need your power now. Not our will, but your will. God, let your will be done today in this place. God, allow your healing power to sweep in this place. And I tell you, he came out of it just as quick as he went in it. Why would I not praise a God who at the, at the mention of his name, he shows up? At the mention of his name, he shows up. You don't have to beg him. You don't have to cry. You don't have to pout. Just call out Jesus and he's there. My God, today I praise God the way that I do because of the evidence that he's given me all throughout these years. I praise God the way that I do because he's a healer and I know him to be a healer. I praise God the way that I do because his promises are yes and amen. Everything I need, yes and amen. God, will you heal me from this? Yes and amen. God, am I coming out of this? Yes and amen. God, will my marriage be okay? Yes and amen. God, will my children be okay? Yes and amen. God, will my siblings be okay? Yes and amen. God, will I lose my mind? No, not my will, but your will, God. Hallelujah, stand all over this place. I told y'all we wasn't going to be long in here today. I hope I blessed you. And I hope that it was something said today that resonates with you, that provokes you to go throughout this week with a praise on your lips. Hallelujah. I said earlier to not allow the enemy to shut your mouth. The biggest mistake that you can make in this season is allowing the enemy to shut you up. 
The old saints used to say, my praise is my weapon. So I challenge you to keep your praise with you the same way you keep that nine on your hip the way that I do. Amen. Keep that praise on your other hip. At this time, I'm going to open up the altar to anyone that wants to come. Jess, if you can come down front. And we're going to open up the altar to anybody who feels...